How's everybody today? It helps when the sun shines, doesn't it? Yeah, for those of you who were in warmer places, you brought it back. We're grateful. <laughs> this morning, I'd like us to look at a passage of Scripture. We've been spending the whole month of January talking about what it's like to have conversations with God. The truth is our life will be limited in a lot of ways unless we know how to have those conversations. But we also are spending the month of February talking about how to have conversations with others about God. How do we have conversations about God? So I'd like us to look in 1 Peter, in the third chapter, and beginning in verse 8. It says, finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason, to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Peter was one of the very original followers of Jesus, and in fact, he was the first person appointed to pastor the first church that was in Jerusalem. And in case you think he started out with a great reputation, actually, he didn't have such a great reputation. And people outside of the community of faith said two things about him. You can read this in Acts chapter 4. It said that he was, they said he was unschooled and ordinary. Can you imagine someone saying that to you and thinking it a compliment? Someone comes up and says, you are unschooled and ordinary, and you go, well, thank you very much. <clears throat> it's not a compliment. But they also noticed he had a confidence that was born out of his relationship with Jesus. And that made a huge influence in the community in which he lived. So Peter, in his letter, is actually giving us some insight on how a person that seems to be very ordinary ordinary and not an expert can have a huge influence in the grace of God expanding in our world. And the first thing we take from this passage is to focus on what you have in common with other people. Focus on what you have in common. The phrase he used is, all of you be like-minded and be sympathetic. Sympathetic doesn't just mean that you feel sorry for someone. It means that you identify with something that they're going through. You can imagine yourself in that situation or you might actually have been through a similar kind of struggle. When you've struggled with the same thing, you can appreciate how hard something is. When, when someone starts a conversation with you that sounds like this, well, you just need to. I mean, no, they probably don't understand what you're actually going through. So start with looking for something in common. It's amazing how often both inside of Christianity and outside of Christianity, the first thing we look for are the differences. Peter says, look for what you have in common. Secondly, learn to act out from the motive of love. Learn to act out from the motive of love. Love one another. Now, love is an interesting concept, and our culture doesn't do the best job defining it. Love always wants what's best for the other person. Love always wants what's best for the other person. So if you were about to come into the room this morning and there was something about your appearance that was embarrassing, 
Wouldn't you want someone to say that something to you before everybody saw you that way? And yes, we would. We, we don't want everybody to see us that way. But not everyone would say something to us. Why not? Maybe they don't care how you look. Maybe they're worried what you will think if they said something to you. The point is, is that when we allow something like that to happen without giving a person a heads up, what we're really showing is that we love ourselves more than we love someone else. We're more concerned about their opinion of us than maybe the others' opinions of them. We miss opportunities because we're protecting ourselves. Love finds a way to say the most wonderful things, and love finds a way to say the most true things. Love finds a way. Uh, the third thing he shows us is to assume you have something to hear, not just something to say. He said, be compassionate and humble. Humble indicates that we still have something to learn. We don't know it all. We're still growing. We're still learning as we go. Uh, I get a little bit uncomfortable when I see someone post a blog about how to have a perfect marriage after they've been married for 30 days. <laughs> Pretty much most marriages are perfect for at least 30 days, you know? Uh, or someone who has a, an infant that's finally sleeping through the night and now they're writing a book on parenting. Let's give that a little time. Let's see how that works out. You know, thanks to technology, I can actually go back and listen to messages that I preached decades ago. And I will tell you, it's painful. <laughs> it's hard. I listen and say, who was that guy? What did he think he knew? Why did anybody listen to him? And you know what? Decades from now, I'll listen to this message and wonder the exact same thing. It sounds defeating, but there's actually an important thing. We're growing as we go. We're learning. That's the position of humility. We're not experts. We're engaged. We're moving forward. It's a really important thing. Acknowledging to someone what has been challenging can gain a lot more credibility than indicating you've never had a challenge. Sharing something that helped you is very different than telling someone else a rule. If you, if you assume you have something to hear, that can be a very powerful way to be an influence in our culture. And then learn the art of blessing. Learn the art of blessing. He says, don't repay evil with evil or insult for insult. On the contrary, you're called to bless. So what does that mean to bless? You know, blessing at the, uh, some, some of us will say a blessing before we eat our food. When, when my son was very little and in school, a teacher asked for the definition of a pagan. What is a pagan? My son shot his hand up, and the teacher called on him, and he said, anybody who eats their food without asking a blessing. <laughs> and the reason that would happen is because our kids would eat their food before a blessing would ask, and I would say, hey, we're not pagans. So that's how, <laughs> that's, that's how that assumption got made. To bless is not just saying some kind of religious-sounding prayer or going through some kind of a vocabulary ritual before you do a thing or after you do a thing. It actually is a way where we were able to discern something of, of God's intention in someone's life, to affirm that, and, and to say something that helps a person stay connected to that. When you bless someone, you're not just saying a nice thing or just saying a spiritual thing. You're saying a true thing, that, that God wants something significant in this person's life, and you want them to keep moving in that direction. Peter then actually refers to a psalm. It was written by King David. If you're interested, it's found in Psalm 34. And this is what he begins to talk about. He said, if you want to embrace life, not just endure it, if you want to embrace life, if you want to see the day filled with good, if that's the kind of person you are, then make sure you don't use your words for evil or deception. And choose peace. Chase it down like it's a really valuable treasure. A person who lives like that, God has a high interest in answering their prayers. That's a really powerful thing to know. Learn the art of blessing. Then he says, who's going to harm you if you're doing good? He said, but... Sometimes people will. 
even when you're trying to do a good thing or the right thing. What he wants us to know is that a lot of the harm can be neutralized by our starting with a position like we've been talking about, a position of humility, of finding what we have in common, of learning how to be a blessing. And here's the thing. If someone else still wants to harm you after that, if they still want to take something from you, what Peter wants us to know is that God's capacity to see what's true in our life and call it forward to bless us, his words will carry more weight than their words. That's what he wants us to be aware of. And then he tells us this, the way to avoid being intimidated, the way to avoid being intimidated is to make Jesus the ruler of your heart. Do not fear their threats, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. There's two really interesting translations. In fact, if you have a, a Bible that has footnotes in it, uh, there, there's a, a footnote that actually says there could be a second translation to this passage uh, where it says, uh, uh, do not fear their threats. So it can mean don't be intimidated by their words. But another translation is, do not fear what they fear. Do not fear what they fear. So you might be asking, well, well, which is the correct translation? And the answer is they're not in conflict with each other. That when people make threats, when people make threats, what they're actually revealing is what they are afraid of. They assume it will work on you because it works on them. There's something about the human heart that once we know how we are intimidated and how we are manipulated, we tend to use those very same things on other people. It's part of the human condition. And what Peter says is the way to, to escape that gravitational attraction is to actually respect, to highly revere Christ as Lord in your heart. The word Lord is not just a, a title that we assign to Jesus, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's more than that. The word Lord means the person who's in authority, the person who has a right to decide, the person who has a right to direct, a person who's Lord of a realm makes the decisions and gives the direction for that realm. And Peter says, make Jesus the one who has authority to give direction and make decisions in your heart. Lord in your heart. What's interesting is that God doesn't demand the right to be Lord of our heart because he's bigger than we are, stronger than we are. He invites us to make him Lord of our heart because he knows us better than anyone and loves us more than anyone. And he's proven that love in the giving of his only child for us, his one and only son. I think we all would acknowledge it takes a lot of love to lay your life down for someone. How much love would it take to allow your only son to give his life for someone? God was willing to do exactly that. So if we respect Christ's authority in our heart, it actually shows up in the choices we make and the decisions we make. We actually start living a little bit differently. And, and this is what's interesting, is that there are lots of things in our lives that we naturally want that aren't actually good for us. Okay? Chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Oreos. Ice cream. I never one time put those items on the table at the end of dinner and had to tell my children, you are not going anywhere until you finish your cookies. <laughs> never. <laughs> Broccoli, cauliflower, lima beans, that was a struggle. Oreos, never had to. The problem was they would sneak them any time of the day or night. Why? Because we naturally are attracted to things that are not actually healthy for us and we actually choose things that will limit us in ways we couldn't possibly imagine and we tend to surrender authority to others in decision making not because we actually think they have their best or our best interests at heart we just don't want to feel bad about an outcome i don't want to feel responsible if that goes south so peter suggests that the way that we can escape that incredible gravitational attraction is that we actually trust the one who loves us the most. Now, I want to say this. Love is proven by what you give, not by what you want. Love is proven by what you give, not by what you want. 
There's lots of people who look each other at each other with stargazed eyes, and they say, I just want you so much. I do. I love you. Those are two very different things. Because there are some people who will take all the pleasure you have to offer, and they will give nothing of value or that matters. And so we need to look to the one who gave. God so loved that he gave. And then always be ready to share why you have hope. Be ready to share why you have hope. Uh, this would indicate that there's something hopeful about the way that we live. Why would we be hopeful? Because we've seen evidence that God is at work. We've seen evidence that we're growing as we go. We believe that, that if someone tries to limit us in some way, that they're not actually in control of our future. That they may cause pain or take something from us in the present, but our future is actually determined by God. And that when we pray, we have access to resources beyond our own. That there's a Heavenly Father who loves us very much, and He's very generous. When you live with hope, people notice, because our world is not known for hopefulness right now. Even when the word is used, it's almost used as a, as a, as a negative, as though it's something beyond the, the possibility of reality. Well, I hope they would do that, but that's not, they don't actually hope. We have to learn how to live out hope. And the reason we have hope is not because we're an expert in life, or even in theology. It's because we've had an encounter with God and we're beginning to understand his heart and we've seen evidence of his love for us in the cross and we've seen evidence of the work he is doing in our life and it just makes us trust and believe that things are actually moving according to his plan, not mine or someone else's. And then he says this, share your reason for hope with gentleness and respect. Isn't our world just awash with gentleness and respect? I can't believe how gentle and respectful everyone is. I mean, if we were gentle and respectful, we would just blend right into the background of everything our culture has, right? No, this is, the problem with our culture is, is not that when we are gentle and respectful that they just think we're, we're like everyone else. The problem with our culture is that when we're gentle and respectful, they assume we're weak. And now so do lots of Christians. Which is why you have people pounding pulpits and getting red in the face and speaking with very harsh terms as though they have some kind of spiritual authority. They don't have authority and they don't have anointing. They're just angry. Really angry. So how is that different from the culture and the world around us? Because I, I can't believe how much anger is being vented at every level. And so Peter says, you want to make an influence? You won't do it by being angry. Give your reason with gentleness and respect. Share your story because it's powerful. Share your story because it's powerful. You might go, my story's not that powerful. It was powerful enough to change your life. How is that not good? That's a story you have to share. You don't have to. By the way, when you share your story, I've had this happen. I've had people say, yeah, but what about this? And then they have the theological question that theologians have argued about for 2,000 years. And they want you to have the answer. Here's Everybody try this. Ready? Three words. I don't know. Let's try it again. I don't know. Oh, one more time. I don't know. Some of you couldn't say it, could you? <laughs> hey, you don't want to admit that. I, I, don't know. I don't know what the resolution of that challenge is in your life, but I do know this is what Jesus has done for me. That's very powerful. You know, the Apostle Paul, his story of his encounter with Christ is listed for us in Acts chapter 9. What's interesting is that we also have his telling of that story on two occasions later in the same book of Acts, in chapters 22 and chapters 26. 
It's a really interesting story. He started out under the name of Saul, and he was from a place called Tarsus, and he was the chief prosecutor against those who claimed that Jesus had resurrected from the dead. He obtained legal authority. He wasn't just going around doing things on a whim. He obtained legal authority to have them arrested and even have them physically punished or tortured. One day while he was on his way to Damascus to carry out this very kind of thing, there was a light that flashed around him, and he fell to the ground. In fact, everybody that was with him fell to the ground. And he heard a voice, and the voice asked him why he was persecuting them. And, and Paul doesn't know who this is, and he says, who is talking to me? And the voice identifies himself as Jesus, the one that you're persecuting. What's interesting is that the men who were with him, while they saw the light and they fell to the ground, they heard a sound, but they didn't understand the words. When Paul got up, he was actually blind at that point. They had to lead him by his hand into Damascus, and after a few days, a believer came to see him and pray for him. His name was Ananias. And when Ananias prayed for him, Paul's sight was restored to him. And he went on to proclaim the truth of this resurrection. He, was, he, he, he prayed for him and he baptized him in water. And, and then he went on to proclaim. And he was actually arrested and imprisoned for the things that he was saying. The things that he did to others was now being done to him. I want you to notice what the elements of his story are. The first thing he tells us is, I thought I was doing something good, but I didn't realize how much harm I was causing. That's a powerful story. I had an encounter with Christ. The light I saw showed me how blind I really was. That's a good story. Others prayed for me, and they helped me learn from God what he hoped and dreamed for me. My eyes were open. I've never been the same. I believe God has forgiven my past. I believe that he's at work in my present, and I believe he's in control of my future. That's a great story. And you have a story that's similar. In fact, I'd like you to think about your own story. In fact, there is a card. I recommend that you just pull this out of the seat back pocket in front of you. Take this home with you today and just take a few minutes to answer the three questions that I'm going to ask you to consider being able to respond to. You won't have to write a whole essay. These things can be done in a single sentence. What were you blind to before you met Jesus? What didn't seem to make sense? What were you doing that you were unable to realize was not healthy for you. So, what were you blind to? You just didn't see something. Uh, second really good question. How did you encounter Jesus? Was it something you heard? Was somebody said something? Was it something you read? What caused the light to go on for you? And how did you respond? It's a really good story. And then thirdly, how has this given a sense of meaning and purpose to your life? How has this empowered you to face things you would rather avoid? It's a very powerful story. And people would be interested in hearing it. Your personal experience is very powerful, but your personal experience can also be a problem. Sometimes we compare our personal experience to someone else's, and it doesn't feel like it quite measures up. Their story seems better. Sometimes we fear that some, maybe I don't have something that's authentic because my story is not as impressive. And here's what I want you to know. Please hear this. God uniquely crafted his interaction with you because he knew what would help bring transformation to your life. And why this is so important is because he'll do the same thing to the people you're telling your story to. It won't all look the same. God comes to you in the way he knows you will receive him. He can do that for anyone. He's done it for you, and he wants to do it through you for others. Let's bow our heads this morning. So you might think your story is quite ordinary. Well, you had some kind of encounter with God that has changed your life. 
and is changing your life. Maybe there were things before you met Jesus, even if you were raised in a religious home, you just didn't see some of the greatest blindness exists in the lives of those who were raised around very religious language. But God found a way to pierce that darkness with a light. And all of a sudden you begin to realize the things you'd been missing, the things that really mattered. And there's a way you responded. For you, maybe you just fell to your knees. Maybe you whispered a prayer. The picture I have is, is like a, a person who didn't know they were running from God and in a moment turned around. And it's like watching one of those emotional YouTube videos where people have been separated for a long time and are being reunited in an unexpected way. And there's just tears and, and running and, and hugs. There came a moment when whether you were doing it on purpose or not, you stopped running from God and started pursuing him. And it makes all the difference. It's brought change to your life. And he's continuing to work. It's your story. No one can tell it for you. But when you tell it, it's amazing what a difference it makes. Father, would you help us today become comfortable telling our story? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand.